change, uh, but um, um, I forget. I don't know what the issue was, but anyway, the, uh, who, who, uh, Kavita, who's the doctor who will do it on Thursday? So he couldn't do it today, so I'm going to do his class instead. So we will uh, do a quiz on pacemaker, um, and we'll just you know start first with uh, the basics, which you all know, uh, which are pacemakers provide electrical stimuli to basically cause cardiac contractions. And they do this by first sensing the intrinsic cardiac potentials. And once they sense it, and then they provide the electrical stimuli. Now the history, interestingly, the cardiac pacing for management of bradyarrhythmias was first described over 60 years ago, 70 years now actually, in 1952. And the first permanent transvenous pacing devices were in the 1960s. And transesophageal pacing is in the 1970s. So I think pacemaker technology goes back a long way. What has been changing is the, the size of the pacemaker and the, the kind of uh, the technology to be able to use it in smaller and younger and smaller kids. So the pacemaker itself has some components. So I'd like you to now name the pacemaker components. You see this is the pacemaker there. So what is this in the middle, the metallic thing? What is that called? Oops, see when you start annotating, it disappears. I'm using a Mac for the first time. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so what is the one in the middle? This one. Yes, so that is the pulse generator. So that is what actually generates the pulse. Okay, so that's the pulse generator. Then, so what are the other, what are the three components of a pacemaker? So one is the pulse generator. What else? Then you have the lead, right? And the thing that connects the lead to the pulse generator. So, uh, uh, that's a pen. You can do a pen. Okay, let me try that. So this is your pulse generator here. Then you've got your electronic circuitry and then connected to that, this thing is your lead. So the main thing is your pulse generator and then your lead. So this would be the components of the pacemaker. Now, what is the current? When you talk about a pulse generator, right? And you are, uh, you, you have, it has a battery within it and that battery has a certain life. What is the current batteries? What are they typically made of? What type of batteries are there in the pulse generator? Type of batteries commonly used in the pulse generator, anyone? Current standard batteries. What type? You know the type of battery you use in your alarm clock and so on. Similarly, the pulse generator has a battery. And these batteries are what sometimes need to be changed uh, depending upon the usage. So if you use your pacemaker, if someone is bradycardic, all the The other and if you have someone who you're just using this as a standby uh, for when they're having stroke atoms or some so on, then and you don't use the battery much, that may last for five or six, seven years. So when you see a patient and you're advising a pacemaker, one of the things to tell them is that you will have to uh, replace the battery. It's not that the pacemaker necessarily gets changed, but a new battery gets put in uh, and that depends upon the uh, how how much the battery is used in the pulse generation generator. So anyone's current standard battery, so it's a lithium iodine battery. That's what's currently used. The advantage of it is it has a longer life than the older cells. So it can last five to 10 years. And of course, uh, when the output, like let's say you're running out of battery, unlike you know a battery that you put in your clocks, for instance, if that battery runs out, the clock stops working. Whereas you can't afford that with a pacemaker, right? You can't have with a pacemaker suddenly stops working. 
and therefore the output voltage will gradually decrease over time. So generally you don't get where the battery will suddenly fail and it becomes an emergency. As long as you're checking that pacemaker at certain intervals, you'll see that the output is decreasing, the battery life is going down, and it gives you time to plan a battery replacement. Okay, so all clear on this point. Now what, when we talk about pacemakers, what is a unipolar, we talk about unipolar and bipolar. What is uni versus bipolarity? What is your understanding of this, anyone? Your understanding of uni versus bi. Nobody wants to take a guess. Uni versus bi. Anyone or is this first class for everyone on pacemaker? So in unipolar, you've got a single negative electrode in contact with the heart. And then your circuit is completed, you have a electrode elsewhere in the body. So for instance, when you put your um, pacemakers in the uh, post-op period, right? You're just going to put one electrode. And then you have got to have outside, you've got to have some another second electrode outside in the body. And that's how the circuit gets completed. In bipolar, what happens is both the electrodes are in contact with the heart. And the circuit is completed right across the small field. That is unipolar versus bipolar. So most of the dual chambers and all these that you use, they are all bipolar. The ones that you use post-op, you know, temporary pacemakers tend to be unipolar. Okay, all clear on this? Now the next question for you is, oops, sorry. What is the type of pacemaker here? And I seem to have put the answer up on the left. If you can see here, this is a dual chamber. You can see, again, now look at the pulse generator here. Right, this is your pulse generator. This is your electron circuitry. This is your leads, right? And you can see one lead is here in the atrium. One lead is here in the ventricle. So this is a dual chamber pacemaker because it's in both the chambers. Now, when you take that pacemaker, now if you look at here, you've taken the pacemaker lead. So you have your generator, let's say in the pocket here uh, below the left clavicle. And then you've taken your leads and you've put them into the ventricle and into the atrium. Now the tip of that lead, right, there are three methods of fixation. And you can see them here. And I want you to tell me what are these methods. So what is the first one? The one on the left. Oops. I gave you the answers I'm trying to annotate. So this one. What is this one called? And what is this? This is second. And then what is this? So let's start with this. What is this first one called? Anyone? Have you got, you, I guess, uh, and here, what is the first one? So you see this, how it's smooth, right? So yes, the third one is the screw in lead. That's right. That's, you can see the screw at the end. So the third one is the one which you will use inside ventricles, right? Because you can, like, you remember the right ventricle. Remember your anatomy is very trabeculated. So if you, you can, and anyway, the ventricles are thick, so you can screw them into the wall. The advantage of the screw in lead is it doesn't come out. You know, the chance of dislodgement is less. What do you think is the disadvantage of a screw in lead? What is the, what's the complication of a screw in lead potentially? Is you can screw too much, right? And you can have perforation. Look how sharp that is. So you could perforate through it. So the other two are what are called Passive fixation. That means in passive fixation, oops, one sec, I lost my, hmm, I lost my annotator. Hold on. Sorry. I'm using this Mac for the first time. Anyway, I have lost my annotator, so I'll do it without. 
So the first, the first two are passive fixation. That means you don't screw anything in. You just put it there and hold, and it, it touches the. Pin tip, it's like a pin. And the third one is your screw in lead. So these are the methods of fixation of pacemaker leads. Okay, all clear? Next question. Typically, the pulse generator is placed subcutaneously. So you know, it's put under the skin, sometimes under the muscle, and it's connected to the leads. Now, that is what we call a when we take the leads and we put them into the vein, like into the subclavian vein. And then into the heart, that is what is called a transvenous, right? But you can have a situation where you take the leads and they are epicardial leads. That means they're not going through the vein, but you're putting them right surgically on the surface of the heart. Now, when you use epicardial leads, you're putting it right onto the surface of the heart. This needs the cardiac surgeon to do an epicardial lead. What is the indication in which patients do you use epicardial leads? What I showed you earlier, if you see this one, this is what's called a transvenous, right? You've got the you've got the pulse generator under the skin, and then you've got your leads, and they're going through the vein, subclavian vein, innominate vein, SVC, and into the atria. This is a transvenous pacemaker. But there is some a category of patients in whom you use epicardial leads, where you don't go through the vein, but you sew them on to the surface of the heart. So post Glenn, um, you're saying because you cannot enter the heart, right? Though, though there are leads that can come from below as well, uh, if you wanted to, through the IVC system. But okay, yes, that is a thought uh, in post Glenn. If you don't want to go through the IVC, say you're going to plan a fontan. You don't want um, cat leads coming through your fontan, right? So in a post fontan situation, you're not going to want anything inside. Um, so that's fine. So that's one indication. Any other age group? Think of an age group in whom you will not do transvenous leads, but your first choice would be epicardial leads. Any age group you can think of in whom you use epicardial leads? Yes, in smaller children. Because what happens? Yes, because if you have a transvenous lead, one one is that the veins are very small, the subclavian veins. The SVC, they're small. So if you put transvenous leads, you have a chance of thrombosis. So in smaller uh, infants and smaller children, epicardial lead will be your lead of first choice, your method of first choice. Not necessarily 10 kilos, but yes, small children. So if you look at uh, indications for epicardial leads is children, uh, and that is one is because the veins are small and um, Secondly, because the whatever you put in children, as the children grow, those leads are going to become too small, right? They're going to be too short. So whatever you do, so say you put transvenous leads. Over time, those transvenous leads are not going to be long enough. So you're going to have to go back, take out the transvenous leads, and put leads again. And that's very difficult because, remember, whatever you put in there will get endothelialized. So that is why in children, typically we don't do transvenous leads. We put epicardial leads. Once they outgrow it, then you can go back in and put your transvenous leads. Other indication for epicardial is if you have lack of vascular access, as we discussed, for example, after Fontan, or if you have some embolic uh, risk, like say you have uh, a patient who has a ASD, you don't want to put a transvenous unless you close the intracardiac shunt. Because if you put a transvenous lead, it's sitting inside the atrium or the ventricle, and there is a shunt. So now let's say you get a thrombus on the lead, what's going to happen? You can have a paradoxical embolus and land up with a stroke. So in anyone who has intracardiac shunting, you would want to go with a epicardial lead with someone who doesn't have vascular access, or something like, yeah, like a fontan where you cannot enter into the heart, right? Because whatever you put up will only be inside the fontan circuit. And most importantly, epicardial leads are used in infants and children because they will eventually outgrow their transvenous leads. Plus, their veins 
um, their subclavian veins, their SEC, everything is small, so high chance of clot um, and thrombosis. Okay, as well as out as well as outgrowing it. Okay, all clear on this. Okay, so what is the advantage of a transvenous lead? What is the advantage of transvenous lead? And what are the disadvantages of transvenous lead? Anyone? What are the advantages? Anyone? Advantages? So the, what are the advantages, right? Tell me. One is the advantage of a transvenous versus an epicardial. So you're inside the heart, right? So the reliability is much better. What else? Of the heart as you do when you do an epicardial. So the advantages are there is no thoracotomy. Because you're going straight into and attaching into the myocardium direct, you have lower pacing thresholds. Because you're going along the circuit kind of the way the blood flows. The disadvantage obviously is venous occlusion. As I, and, and, and as a child grows, your lead length is going to be an issue. And that's why if you see here, if I go back to that picture I showed you earlier, you will see here, you see how a loop is left? So typically they will leave a loop around here so that as a child grows, that thing can pull out the loop. But if you put a transvenous lead in a very young kid, even as the, as the kid grows, even if you have the loop, at some point, you will outgrow the leads, and that's again that's when the issue arises when you have to go back in and do the procedure all over again. Okay, so these are the advantages and disadvantages of transvenous leads. Now we'll move on to the actual pacemaker uh, function that it does. And these are, you know, topics that you have to, and you need to know these, these things well. What is rate? What is sensitivity? What is threshold? So let us say, what is rate? You know, it is the heart rate at which the pacemaker will pace. That is the rate. Now, what is standby rate? What is standby rate? Anyone? And let's do this rapid fire, guys. Anyone for standby rate? 